So, uh, my name is Martin. I'm from the Econova Superior de Rio. Uh, I'm from France, but actually I'm working in France, which also means that I have three affiliations, although I have a single desk. <laughs> I'm also affiliated to INRIO, which is like an institute for computer science and, and uh, automatization, and also for the Ronald Complex System Institute, which is in Lyon, and in Grenoble, but I'm in Lyon. So, as Radek already mentioned, I'm going to speak about temporal networks, so I will try to answer also the questions you already asked from Bruno. Uh, and I want to speak about spreading processes on temporal networks. As for literature, we are lucky to have actually two reviews on temporal networks very recently. One was published by Peter Huona, who is going to give a school on Monday here, and by Yaris Ramaki, and the second one was published by Peter Huona. Okay. Uh, the second one is a bit, little bit more detailed. The first one is a little bit more easy to read. Also, there is a book edited by Peter Horn and Jarek Saramaki, by Springer, you can also have a look at that book. Okay. Very well. So I'm going to speak about temporal networks. In order to speak about temporal networks, first we have to understand why temporal networks are important. We know that in the last 15, 20 years of network science, in the very beginning, people were thinking about, when you said number of networks, people were associated with static networks which were usually aggregated network structures. So we had a set of nodes, these nodes were connected by a set of links, and we assumed that nothing is changing. The nodes are there, the links are there, it's in invariant of time. We worked out a lot of features, or a lot of uh, measures, in order to characterize this type of networks on any level, on the microscopic level. We were looking for features of nodes and links. In the micro uh, mesoscopic level, we were discussing communities, for example, or the, micro the macroscopic level, we were speaking about the statistical description of the complex networks, like degree distribution, average clustering coefficient, average of any properties. Okay? Uh, in terms of dynamical processes, as Bruno has already discussed, here the assumption is that we have a static structure, it's not changing, we have a process on the top, which also means that from the point of the process, all the links and nodes are always there. Okay? So we have a static structure, we have an SI, SIR, an SIS process, it is evolving on the top, and the main question is how the different structural heterogeneities characterizing the network structure are influencing the dynamical process, process evolving on the top. As Bruno explained, degree distribution is a very important feature because if the degree exponent of a complex network is between 2 and 3, uh, actually the critical point or the critical threshold by the perspective process is going to zero. Larger the degree heterogeneity is in the network, smaller the threshold value is. It means it's a catastrophic uh, message actually, which means that it's really difficult to control uh, epidemic spreading on scale networks. The second step that we are that we have already done after static networks, we were thinking, thinking about evolving networks. Uh, good example, for example, the, uh, the observation of Barabashi, who realized that in order to define a model which is generating a scale free network, we need two properties. One is the preferential attachment, and the other that the network is evolving as a function of time. Okay? So in this uh, level, what we are interested in, how links are created, and in other case, deleted, how nodes are coming and going. So somehow the network has a temporal evolution, but it is still slow because we are not speaking about direct interactions, we are speaking about the existence of a link. In case of a social network, you can think that I have a friend, it's a fact, I can interact with my friends, which means that I have a higher frequency of interactions than the existence of a link. If I break up with my girlfriend, this link is not there anymore, I'm not interacting anymore with her. Okay? So there are two di there are differences uh, between the definition of an existence of a link and the interaction on the top of it. So in case of evolving network, we also uh, characterized uh, structural properties, how it is, evolved, for example, evolving communities and mesoscopic scale, and so on and so forth. But still, we have to apply a very important assumption in case of dynamical processes, also what already Bruno mentioned, assuming that there is a time scale separation. 
we assume that this dynamical processes, which is evolving on the top of the evolving network, is evolving in a way faster temporal scale than the network itself. So from the point of view of the dynamical process, we can consider the network to be static. Okay? This is what as this, this assumption has been made in the last 15, 15 years. Okay? Until the point that actually we had data uh, to analyze the temporal interactions, not only the condition of the existence of things between nodes. And here arrive to the temporal network approach, which is describing a network evolution or the interactions between agents on the single level of interactions and nodes. Okay? So this is the finest possible scale we can reach. For example, in case of social network, if we are not trying to go lower than the cognitive level. Okay? We are not. Uh, the challenge here is that everything what we have measured or defined, all the measurements we have defined earlier, we have to redefine, because here degree means something else because it becomes time dependent, clustering coefficient, pass length, all these measures have to be redefined in case of temporal networks, and this is actually an ongoing challenge. The field is about two, three years old, so there are a lot of things to do if you are interested in temporal networks. I suggest you to, to move in this direction. In terms of dynamical processes, on the other hand, the picture is very different than in case of static network. Why? Because here we assume that the dynamical process is evolving with the same time, on the same temporal scale as the network itself. What does it mean? It means that if I am trying to pass an information to my friends, in the static network representation I could do it in any time because I assume that this, the link between me and my friends are always there. Because if a temporal network is not true, I can pass information just at the time of my interaction with someone else. Okay? And this changes a lot on how the dynamical process actually unfolds on a temporal network. Uh, I, this is just a simple example of a temporal network. This is the mobile phone communication network. The static network, which was integrated over six months, this is a sample, of course, uh, is the green. Uh, network behind, and what you see are the SMS and call interactions between people as a function of time. You can make already a few observations here. First of all, that uh, the frequency of interactions is changing as a function of time, of course, because during day, the day we interact more than during the night. And also, you may see, like for example, this is five in the morning on a Tuesday. You see, you, you may also see like correlated interactions. Uh, intuitively, like for example, if I call Bruno that I want to have a beer with him, and he calls our common friend Nicola, so that my call was actually inducing a call by Bruno to Nicola, so there might be some causal relationships between events. This is because of called temporal motives, so it's because of that later. Okay? So, the, actually, what we would like to understand what is the difference between the green and the arrows which are popping up. Okay? We would like to understand how we arrive from the arrows, from the temporal interactions, to the green, to the structure. What are those microscopic correlations which are driving our interactions, inducing the emergent heterogeneous social network? Okay? That's the main question of temporal networks, or one of the main questions of temporal networks. Very well. In order to answer the question before, uh, we can draw this. Uh, relative scales, so we can explain temporal networks, or we can explain different types of networks as a function of the scale, how the network is evolving. So we assume that we have an observation frequency. This can be an observation frequency, this can be also the frequency or the time scale, how the dynamical process is evolving. If the temporal scale of the network is very slower, let's, in this case we speak about, for example, quench networks, where there are no where the interactions and nodes are not fun to change as a function of time, the network is static. Okay? If the temporal scale is a little bit faster, so then I have, for example, links created and nodes created, they are coming and going. This is what we call the evolving networks. As I already mentioned, in this case, we still apply the time scale separation, assuming that our observation or the dynamical process is evolving is evolving in a time scale way faster than the network, so we can assume that this network is uh, static from the point of view of the dynamical process. 
For example, the internet itself, where the link creation is very slow because actually they have to make physical wires between routers or between stations, or social networks in terms of creating or breaking social relationships, social ties. On the other hand, if the consider network which has a time scale even faster, we arrive to the regime where the, the time scale of observation and the time scale of the network evolution becomes similar. This is nothing for the time temporal networks or time line networks or dynamic networks. Okay? These are all the same, uh, they're referring to the same uh, animal. Here, what we actually consider not only the creation of links, but the recurrent interactions between, between different agents. So, for example, if I call my battery five times, uh, the existence of the link is there because there is a social tie between me and my brother, but in this representation, I consider each call separately between me and him. Okay? The best examples are, for example, mobile phone communication, where we know how people are interacting, or, for example, the sexual contact network. Uh, there, is a, there are networks like this, actually, there are temporal sexual co uh, contact networks. There is a good example that was collected in Brazil through an online prostitution website. Okay, so there you can see how different people are interacting as a function of time, how recurrent interactions are appearing, and for example, how these recurrent interactions in case of a sexual network are, tra uh, are driving the spread of sexual transmitted diseases. Okay, so this is, that's why it's an important thing. On the other hand, we can go in the other way that as compared to our observation frequency, the network is evolving faster, which means that, I don't know how many of you are a physicist, but, so it means probably at first year, you were making some stroboscope experiment about motion, so that you have uh, something which is moving and there is a light spotting, and then each time you see, just at the time when the stroboscope is spotting, you see what's happening, okay? So this is exactly what we do here. The frequency of observation is smaller than the frequency of change of the system. Okay? If they are still not very different, it means that the correlation between two consecutive observations is still not zero. So they are somehow, they observe some kind of relationship between consecutive observations. This is what I call the snapshot networks. Okay? Here what we have, consecutive snapshots are correlated and approximate the temporal network evolution if this is going back to the frequency of temporal networks. Okay? For example, the word by word. On the other hand, if your observation frequencies start to get way slower than the evolution, the frequency of evolution on the network, but we will see, we will see independent snapshots. Because the network is changing so much between two observations that there is no correlation measurable between two consecutive observations. This is where actually the main field approximation becomes correct. Okay, this is what people call the anil network. Okay, so just a few words about what are temporal networks and how they are related to the different temporal scales. Very well. Some examples of temporal networks I already mentioned to you. Spoke about person-to-person -person communication networks like calls, SMSs, emails, or face-to-face -face interactions. In terms of data, I don't know whether you are aware of the Sociopathon project. This is a project which is providing face-to-face -face interaction data openly available, uh, run by ISI Torino and ex Marse University. So if you, are, if, we, if you want to have temporal face-to-face -face interaction data, go on their website. We can also speak about temporal networks as one-to-many dissemination, like for example Twitter, or in distributed computing systems or infrastructural systems, for example transportation networks are very good examples of temporal networks. Here there is a little bit uh, more uh, advanced example. This is a network of pedestrian zebras or in, uh, in a city. So the greens are when the, the traffic light is green on the zebra you can cross and so on and so forth. This can be also interpreted as a temporal network because there is a connection between the two sides of the street just at the time when the light is green. And finally, you can also speak about biological networks. You can identify interaction between proteins as a function of time. Okay? Very well. Now that we know what are temporal net what temporal networks are, we can speak about only a few words, how to describe them, how to represent them, and how how to measure a few very basic 
characteristic. So if you speak about a static graph, we usually speak about it is defined by a set of nodes and a set of links between them. Uh, these sets do not change as a function of time. However, in the case of temporal networks, we can actually interpret the network with a third set which describes for each link when this link is active uh, during the observation, let's say. Okay? Which means that for each link we have a set of times describing that, for example, there was an interaction between this node and this node at time 3, 2, 3, and 9. Okay? This is a very intuitive description, but it is not very useful. We can do it better, and we can speak about, we can interpret uh, temporal networks as contact sequences, where actually we have events, we define events, which consists of the timestamp, the interaction, and the, the two ends of the interaction. So this is, let's say, in case of mobile phone communication, this is the guy who calls, this is the guy who was called, and usually these events, events, if you look at data sets, are coming together with different attributes. For example, the duration of the interaction, some other type, some nature of the interactions, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is a very better interpretation. I, uh, I'm not going to describe further interpretation. There are many others. You can use graphlets, interval networks, multi-layer networks to describe the temporal network. I'm going to use, actually, this type of interpretation, but I have a time, and I have who was interacting with who. So one event is a single triplet. OK? Very easy. Uh, if you turn to data, actually, as I told, there are many attributes usually coming together with an event, sometimes also the location where the interacting agents were at the time of interactions. Yes? Is direction between the two vertices implied by their order? It depends on the definition. Yeah, so you can you can actually consider it as a directed or undirected interaction. Also, uh, you can identify direction in terms of the dynamical processes, processes which are going on the top. In the examples I'm going to show, as I will explain, I will always assume that if there is an interaction between you and me, and I know something, I can pass it to you independent of the direction of the interaction, because if I make a phone call, but, you know, we change the information is both direction. If I write an SMS, it's a different story because there, there is a unidirectional possibility to flow, information to flow. Okay? Very well. So, we know how to, dis we know what are temporal networks, we know how to describe them. Uh, just a few characteristics of them. Uh, one of the main difference of temporal networks from static networks, that the description of paths or the definition of paths is changing. It's changed. It's different. So in case of a uh, static network, as Bruno already told, so you must know it, the path between two nodes is a sequence of links uh, describing a possible walk that you can reach node I, uh, from node I, node J. Okay? In case of temporal networks, this definition has to change because this path has to respect the order or the sequence of the events. Okay? So if there is a path in the static network, or in the static network representation of a temporal network, it does not necessarily mean that there is a path in the temporal representation. Because if there is a path between me and Radek at time 1, and between Radek and uh, Bruno at time 3, uh, it, it means that there is a path between me and, uh, and Bruno. But if the first interaction is between Radek and Bruno, and the second interaction is between me and Radek, there is no pass between me and Bruno, right? Because the information, I cannot pass information to Bruno because that interaction happened before than me, okay? So this, that's why we have to redefine temporal passes, or we have to redefine passes and speak about time-respecting passes in case of temporal networks. The other features or other differences that we cannot the temporal ne networks are not reciprocal, so the extent, the extensive of the pass ij does not guarantee the existence of the pass ji exactly because of the sorted uh, nature of events. So if there is a pass between me and Bruno, it doesn't mean that there is a pass between Bruno and me. Okay? Also, we can speak about non-transitivity, which means that if there is a pass between ij and 
uh, between i, j, and j, k, it doesn't mean that there is a pass between i and k. Okay? Exactly for the same reason, because of the ordering of the units. And also we can realize that it's one thing that there is a pass between me and Bruno now, but it doesn't mean that there, will be a, there was a pass five minutes ago, or there will be a pass in five minutes. So actually the existence of a pass is depending on time. Okay? Very well. Why am I speaking about all this? Because actually I would like to arrive to the definition of the Richard iteration. So, in order to do that, we have to still understand what is the influence set of mode i and what is the source set of mode i. If you think about a piece of information I would like to pass in, in a social network just by temporary interactions, let's say that I have this information right now, I learn about something, and I give it this information to anyone who I'm speaking with. Okay? So actually there will be a set of people with a fun a large increasing set of people as a function of time who can be aware of the information I would like to pass after I start to spread it. Okay? This is this set of people what's called the influence uh, set of me at time t because of course it's depending on time uh, depending on the time when I got this information by myself. The other, the opposite definition is the source set actually the set of people who can pass me information at time, um, at time t. So this is those large set of people who have a time-respecting path which is reaching me at time t. Okay? So, and finally we can actually define the reachability ratio, which is the average fraction of nodes who can be reached by node i at any time during the observation. Okay? This is characterizing, for example, a person who is uh, very influential people might have a very large uh, reachability ratio because he might reach many people in the, in the network. Or if there is a people who never speak to anyone, uh, a person who never speaks to anyone, his reachability ratio will be zero by definition. Okay? So the reachability ratio can characterize actually the influence of a person or of a node in the temporal network. Okay? Very well. Now that we know a few characters of temporal networks, I can go to the main subject of my talk, models of temporal networks. So far, there have been two directions provided in order to model temporal networks. I'm going to speak about this direction, randomized reference models, today, today and I will speak about generative network models tomorrow, after lunch as well, <laughs> just uh, helping your digestion. So, about what is the difference? In case of randomized reference models, what we do, we have an empirical network, an empirical temporal network, an interaction sequence between something, between nodes, okay? And then we try to shuffle this interaction sequence in a, in a clever way, <coughs> sorry, in order to remove some static or temporal correlations from the sequence, from the temporal network. And we put a time interval process on the top and see that by removing the different correlations, how the evolution of the time interval process is changing. Okay? That is the main idea. In case of static network, a reference model, typical example is a configuration network model. What is the configuration network model? Um, the original definition of a configuration network model is that you have a degree sequence and you are connecting nodes, you assign degrees to nodes and you connect these nodes randomly so that you will have a maximum random structure but a preserved degree distribution of the emerging network. Okay? There is the modified or more applied way of configuration network model which is not entirely the same as the configuration network model, but is almost the same. When you have a network structure, let's say a social network, which has a given degree distribution, its communities, and so on and so forth, and you are actually swapping the links in the network structure, which means, I will explain it later, you select two links randomly and you change the angle of the two links uh, in many times, actually. I will explain it later. So in case of static networks, this is 
a randomization process, or this is a randomized reference model. Okay? In case of camper networks, it's a little bit different. I will tell you a few examples of it. The other direction in terms of model and networks is generative models, where you take the usual modeling approach coming from physics, that you have agents, you have a set of rules, and you are applying these rules in order to determine who is going to interact with who, and then you have an emerging structure, and you would like that the emerging structure satisfies some conditions, for example, uh, to have a broad degree distribution or a clustering coefficient and so on and so forth. For example, the, the Borobasha of that network model is a typical generative network model where you have the rule of preferential attachment and the evolution and you receive a, a scale free network free exponent 3. Okay? In case of so it, it means the first step I would pass the information to mode C, and the second step I would pass from C to B. On the other hand, if I consider that these, these, these agents are interacting as a function of time, the first interaction will bring the information from A to D, the second interaction will be from D to B, then from uh, A to C, and finally, only the, this last interaction will bring the information from A to B. Okay? So just by considering the fact that the interactions are temporal, we observe that the evolution for the step of information is slowing down considerably. This is an example to demonstrate this. This is a spreading process uh, on a static network and on a temporal network. Okay? So in one case, what we do is that we have the temporal interactions, we inter integrate them over time, so we receive the static network representation, we put a spreading process on the top, and we reach everyone in the network in about seven time steps, or six time steps, okay? On the other hand, now we don't integrate over time, but we consider the temporal interactions, and we allow the spread of information just due to the interactions, and we reach the maximum number of people in about 10,000 time steps. So there are four orders of magnitude difference in time between uh, the temporal and the static network representation in order to reach the equilibrium state of the spreading process. It is very surprising. Okay? This also would suggest that what we have done so far is uh, not as precise, <laughs> let's say it in a politically correct way, but it was anyway very, very useful because we'll, you know, if you consider the full complexity of a system at the first step, you will never learn about anything about it. Okay? Very well, just to highlight, it is important that you consider temporal interactions. Yes? Yeah, so this is actually an entire direction in temporal networks. This is called adaptive networks, where the network structure and the processes are co-evolving. This is another good example for, like, in case of Ebola, Ebola, where you know the social behavior of people changed dramatically when they got known that actually their neighborhood, something in the neighborhood is infected, which means that the sort of social network itself changed due to the evolving process, which was Ebola, okay? So there is a, a direction in, 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 in the temporal networks working uh, on this, okay? Very well. So, uh, another, sorry, I don't see the slide. Uh, what we have observed so far is that we have to consider temporal interactions. So better to consider temporal interactions than the static representation of a network in case of spreading processes, and that the information spreading, for example, is very, very slow when we do this, okay? This can be due to the temporal interactions, but there is another factor uh, which has to be considered. If you think about the evolution of a network, I spoke already about duality, that I know the interactions between people, 
which also means I know when different links appear as a function of time. Which means that just by looking at the temporal interactions, I can draw the evolution of the network. Okay? So if I am an inform if I have an information from this point of from the point of the information, I have to wait that a large connected component of temporarily reachable persons evolve as a function of time. Okay? Which means because no information can pass in the network faster than the evolution of this component. Okay? Because you can pass information only between nodes who have interacted uh, before, uh, after you got the information. Okay? Do you get it? You can also think without the information. If you just have a look at the network and you start to understand how uh, the network is evolving, you will see the evolution of the largest connected component. This evolution of the largest connected component of the network limits the spread of any type of information in the network because there is no possible way to pass information between these connected nodes. Okay? This is another factor what you have to consider when you think about information spreading in temporal networks. Very well. So the approach that we are going to do here is a data-driven approach. What we do is that we take an empirical data set, which is a sequence of interactions, and we take a model uh, dynamical process, we, talk, we put the model dynamical process on the top of the empirical data set, and we see what happens. Okay? So the model, what we are using, is the simplest possible scaling model. This is called the SI model, the susceptible infected model, where each node can be in two mutually ex, uh, exclusive states, whether infected or susceptible. It is a very normalized model, so the number of infected people and the number of susceptible people is summing up to the system size very well. Uh, and this is the spreading scheme. If uh, I have an infected node A, which calls a susceptible node B at time T, next time step they will be both uh, infected. In the representation of Bruno, it means that the infection rate is equal to 1. Okay. Or the other case, if A is susceptible and he is calling B, he still gets infected. This is actually what I refer to. It's a bidirectional spreading. I don't consider the direction of the interactions. I assume that they can pass information uh, just by calling each other. Okay? Next, what we do is we use a data set. So the data set, what I'm going to apply here, is a mobile phone call data set which consists of about 600 million voice call records between about 6 million users, connected to by about 16 million edges, a lot of six on this slide. And this is a weighted network, where the weight is defined as the number of interactions between two people. Okay? And this is a, actually a simple visualization of a snowball sample of this network of a single city. Okay? Very well. So this is the network that I'm going to deal with, but don't forget, this is a temporal network, consists of 600 million interactions. So what I do, let just start, okay. What I do is the following. I have the network, I select a single node randomly, I give him or her a single information, which means that I set him or her infect, to be infected, and I allow this information or inf infection spreading just by due to the mobile call interactions between this guy and others. And then, iteratively, for other people who got infected during the process. So what you see here, it, first of all, is that it is striking out very slowly. And actually, to reach the 100% of the network, even if it's a few hundred nodes, it takes about 600 days, which is very slow. If you think, that how much, how fast information spreads in our society. And we speak a lot on mobile phones. If we just would wipe out everything and only consider mobile phones to disseminate information, it would be very, very slow. Just as it has been shown here, even we assume the fastest possible spreading. We assume that if I speak with someone, I necessarily tell him or her the information I have. Okay? So the question is, why? The experiments what we are going to do 
are this are data driven experiments. Yes? Sir. Yeah. So I was thinking that how the spreading process on the temporal network is different than on being on the generative network. Because here I see the one tree which is seed and then the tree is growing, which is the same model which of the generative uh, model. So the, so the seed was implanted on the network, on one node, and then the spread was as per the tree. Mm -hmm. The tree structure was spread. Yeah. In, the gener uh, in the generative networks also, the, there is a seed node and then the yeah, is well, the difference is not this, because in case of a generative network, there is anyway a spreading tree. The difference here is actually that in this case, I'm using a real temporal network. In case of a generative network model, I'm always generating the network itself. So I have a model to generate the network dynamics. Here, I'm using the real dynamics. Otherwise, from the spreading point of view, there is no difference. Okay? So. Actually, what I'm going to do here is that I take a sequence of real uh, interactions in case of here mobile phone con communication. I put an SI process, I initiate it from a randomly selected node at a randomly selected time, and I allow the spreading with infection rate equal to 1 until everyone gets infected in the network. Of course, I have an assumption the network has to be connected. Yes? Uh, <coughs> my question about this is that. Uh, so, if I understand correctly, you take uh, a temporal network and then uh, you ask the question, using this temporal network, how fast could be a spreading process? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, uh, I mean, if you want to spread information, then maybe that couldn't be the temporal network of that spreading process. Of course, I mean, in real life, Information is spreading through many other channels. Than no, but I'm not saying this. I'm saying that you say, for example, uh, assume that they want to spread something using a, like a cellular network, okay. a microphone network, and you say, look, that would be much slower. But in fact, if I want to spread some information, I wouldn't spread it on the spreading network. I would spread it on my contact network. And I would be much more efficient because uh, if I really want to spread this specific information, that I start calling everyone. And this is not constrained mm -hmm. by the diffusion network. If it's okay. network yeah, this is depending on the nature of the information you would like to spread. If you think about mobile phone viruses, for example, which can be sent by MMSs, for example, there you are not aware that you are spreading something. You have the usual business. You are sending, uh, you are communicating in a, in a normal way. There is no adaptive feedback changing your behavior in order to interact in a different way because I have something very important to spread. So this is, don't think about that I want to spread information on a mobile phone communication network. Think about that how spreading is working on temporal networks. Yeah, but that's exactly my point, I think. It looks like when you, when you make these examples, uh, the, the network that you say is the temporal network where something is spreading, to me sounds like uh, the spreading network on top of the stuff network. Uh, like when you make this example about uh, Again, mm -hmm. that was your example. I mean, you say, okay, I call her, and then uh, I call him, and then information can only pass here. But it's not that information can only pass between me and her uh, because uh, I'm calling. I mean, if I want to pass information to her, actually, if we are a contact, if I have her in my contact list, I can do it that at any time. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm Yeah, I, I understand, but we, we, in this case, we completely neglect any. Like in, intrinsic motivational change. So it's not it's not that I want to spread information. I'm looking for a possibility, or I'm looking how an information would spread without people changing their behavior. Okay. Okay. Now we can speak about yeah. it later. It's a bit more enough for the philosophical end. Uh, I, I think then uh, maybe your your previous comment that what has been done before is uh, inaccurate. That. Sure yeah, that. I know that this is a really provocative statement. No, yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I, tomorrow actually I will use the methodology which was developed in the last 15 years. So that's why I say that it's not that it's, it's actually it was necessary to do in order to understand this. Okay. Okay. 
so uh, I have an empirical network, I have an extra process, I started from a single, uh, randomly selected node at a randomly selected time, I let the process to evolve that everyone is reached by the information, and then, so I record this, I repeat it many times, I calculate the average spread curve, and then I take the original sequence, and I shuffle it in a clever way, as I already mentioned, I remove but due to this shuffling, some correlations from the structure, and do everything over again and compare the results. If I do it in a good way, I may have, I may understand something how this correlation is influencing the spreading of the process on the temporal network. Okay. So the first thing, but as I told you, what I what we do, we measure the fraction of infected nodes in the network as a function of time. This is where I gave the information to a single node. It is evolving as a function of time. I can tell you there, there are still nodes here which are not infected, because if you think about there are nodes, there are people who make one call per year. It's very difficult to pass information to them. And of course, they are in the mobile phone call, mobile phone call network. So this actually goes till 600 days. Okay. In this case, what I consider I consider four different types of correlations. I will speak more about them. Uh, I consider late topology correlation, versus dynamical correlations, even even correlations and community structure. Okay? These are the correlations which may be present in the social network and I would like to consider. So the first one is let's say speak about first about community structure. What are communities? Communities, vaguely speaking, are subgraphs which are better connected inside than to the rest of the network. Okay? This is a very intuitive definition. Uh, how can we remove the effect or how can we remove communities from a network? Actually, we have to apply the shuffling method that I already mentioned. We select, we take the network, the static network, we select two edges, we select randomly uh, one end of each edge. And we change the link, we rewire the link, we swap the ends of the link. So, for example, if I have selected link IJ and the other link UV, after the swapping method, I will be connected to V and you will be connected to J. Why is it good? Because actually, the degree of I or degree of any node with this method will not change. Okay? So, I will preserve the degree distribution. I will also preserve uh, the link weights or the overall weight distribution, because actually I'm not changing the number of interactions or the link weight on a given link. All the interactions which was originally made between I and J, I make now between I and V. Okay, so I don't change the weight distribution. What I destroy is the community structure, because then this type of structures will disappear because nodes will be randomly linked over all the network. I also re remove degree correlations. Degree correlations means that the tendency whether large and large or large and small degrees are better connected to one of the spectrum only. Okay? And I also destroy what we call the topology correlations. I'm going to speak about it on the next slide. So if you do this, what we have is that I remove all the possible correlations I was looking for and I measure again the SNAP process and it gets faster. Which means that the old combination of these, all these correlations that I removed with this shuffling method have actually, has actually a strong effect on the speed of spreading because by removing them, the spreading process becomes way faster than uh, when I was using the original empirical sequence. Okay? Now we can do it step by step. The next step what we do, we consider another type of uh, structural correlation, what is called the weight topology correlation also called the Granovectarian correlation, which assumes that those links, those social ties, which are strong and maintained by a large number of interactions, tend to be sitting inside communities, while those links which are maintained by small number of interactions are between communities. Okay? Also quantified due to the, by these correlations, where this is the cumulative weight, and this is the link overlap. I don't know, but do you know what is the link overlap? The link overlap is pretty much like the clustering coefficient of a link, 
which means that I have a link, I and J connected, and I count how many common friends I and J has, and then I count how many possible common friends they could have. I can count it just by the degrees, and then take the fraction of the two. If all of their common friends, all of their friends are common, this overlap measure is equal to one. If they have no common friends, this overlap measure will be zero. Okay? Which means that if, uh, and this is the other claim of Rano vector, that links which are inside communities have higher overlap values, they have more common friends, and links which are between communities, they have smaller overlap values, they have less number of common friends. Okay? And actually this correlation shows exactly this one, that actually those guys who have higher overlap, they have also higher weight. Okay? Strong ties are sitting inside communities. So this is another effect, another correlation which can affect the spreading of information. Why? Because if the information is spreading inside the community, because there are a lot of interactions between people of the same community, but it may be stuck because there is just spurious interactions from the community to the rest of the world. Okay? So due to these correlations, the spreading process can be stuck inside communities. Okay? How to remove this? It's very simple. What you have to do, you have to decouple the structure, the static structure, and the link weights. So what you do is that you select two edges randomly from the network, and you replace their event sequences. Okay? Which means that the weight, which is the number of interactions on a link, will appear on another randomly selected link. The in everything is the same, so the timing of the interaction is the same, the number of the interaction is the same, but this strong link will not be here, but it will be on the randomly selected link. Okay? Very well. With this, actually, you are destroying simply the, the weight topology correlation, okay? Well, you also destroy another temporal correlation I'm going to speak about later. But what you keep is the community structure, because after you didn't change the structure itself at all, you also keep the degree distribution, the degree correlations, and the weight distribution. Okay? So if you do this, your process is getting a little bit slower, but still faster than the regional process. Which means that actually the effect of weight topology, the pure effect of weight topology correlation is the distance between the red and the blue line. Okay? Now we spoke about two structural correlations, let's speak about two temporal correlations. One temporal feature of human interactions is burstiness. Do you know what is burstiness? The burstiness is the tendency of people or a character of people that they don't act, I'm speaking about any type of human action, uh, uh, homogeneously as a function of time. But for example, if I'm looking at my emailing or my mobile communication, well, my mobile communication is very, very spurious. There are periods when I'm writing a lot of emails, and then there are long periods when I do nothing in terms of email writing, of course. Which means that if you look at the inter events, the time between my two consecutive emails written, if you look at the distribution of these inter events, it is a broadly distributed something, okay? A distribution which is a tail. I cannot say that this is a power law, because if you look at an empirical network, it is a very strange animal. It is very, it's ranging over several orders of magnitude, but it's everything but a power law. Anyway, so what is the original assumption about uh, human actions? The sim simplest possible assumption what we can make is that if you assume that people are acting homogeneously as a function of time, like here, Actually, if you measure the inter event time distribution, it will be an exponential. This is what's called the Poisson process. Okay? If we assume, or actually, if we take the observation that this is not true, but the interactions uh, are separated by short times and long inter event times, and we measure the interaction, the inter event time distribution becomes power, becomes power law, assigning some temporal heterogeneity in the actions of people, this is what's called burstiness. This is observed also in case of earthquakes. In case of firing neurons, human interactions, and so and so on and so forth. How to characterize it? As I already told you, we can characterize this behavior with the interleven time distribution. It is a broad distribution in case of burst signals, 
and it is an exponential distribution in case of a Poisson process. Okay? There is another measure called uh, the burst parameter, which is actually the coefficient of variation of the interim times. You take the interim time sequence, you calculate the average of the interim time, no, the standard deviation of the interim time minus the average over the average, the uh, standard deviation plus the average. Okay? If this B parameter is equal to zero, you have a Poisson process. If it is equal to one, it's a maximally bursty process, which means that all the events are happening at one time. Or it, if it is minus one, you have a regular signal. The interim time is a Poisson. Very well. So, if we look at the interaction sequence in mobile communication data set, actually what we observe is that it is very bursty. So the interim time distribution, yeah? Sorry, can you, um, just about this maximum burstiness, looking at the formula, it can also be very regular, but, you know, with the same intervals, okay. Since it's just looking at the mean and standard deviation, it doesn't exactly mean that it has to be maximally bursty. They can also repeat from time to time, creating the large standard deviation, but the... Sorry, maybe I, I will ask you later, personally. I think you speak about the second case. If, uh, the stand, the, if the signal is regular, which means that there is the same constant interval time between consecutive events, this is maximum, then the first parameter is minus one. The other case, when, uh, so think about almost maximally bursty signal when there are events which are very close to each other and separated by very large interval times, where the standard deviation is very large. Just assume that the standard deviation is unfinite. Yeah. But we can speak about it later, it's really a technical detail. Yeah. Okay? Very well. So how can we remove this bursty temporal or bursty temporal behavior from the interaction signal. It is what called the shuffle time, uh, time shuffling uh, reference model. So what you do is that you take the interaction sequence, okay, so node i was interacting with node j at time 1, 9, again, and so on and so forth. And actually what you do is you shuffle the times of interactions between interactions, okay? So the interaction between i and 1 and 2 will appear now in a random time which was appearing as an interaction time in the original sequence, let's say four, okay? Then the interaction between two and three will not be anymore at three, but it will be at one, okay? So what you do is actually, you keep the number of interactions between people, just you assign to them a random time selected from the whole interaction time what you observed in the signal. So what does it do? Of course, it will destroy bursty temporal patterns because what you are doing is actually homogenizing the interaction sequence. Okay? It actually destroys every possible temporal correlations, but it keeps every structural correlations because it's not concerning the structure at all. Okay? An alternative, alternative null model could be that if you take the whole period and you assign a random time, not selecting from the available times of interaction, but you assign random time to a given interaction from the whole observation window, okay? That would be the true Poissonization of the temporal signal. Yeah? Yeah, uh, just asking for the motivation uh, between these two. I guess it's a good because if you have some correlation, some global correlation, time correlation in the data, this is different. I like don't then, understand. I'm uh, sorry. If you have some uh, global correlation of the timing yeah. uh, in the data, then the second approach with the completely random time will destroy that. Yeah. So for example, switching between day and night. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you see, so the, the advantage of the, this null model, not this one, this null model, that it's destroying every possible temporal correlations, but it is reserving, preserving the original um, interaction frequency, so the overall interaction frequency. If you still count how many interactions happen between 2 a.m. And, and 3 a.m., it will be the same. It's just a bit, uh, you know, the correlations between events will be fully destroyed. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So if you originally the increment time is a parallel, then what's the new increment time after the reshuffle? It's an exponential. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you do this, 
Uh, actually, your signal for your spreading process is slowed down as compared to the our previous lambda, and this is still considerably slower than the original sequence. Okay, so here what we destroyed is we kept the weight of project correlations because we didn't change the number of interactions between people, we changed just the timing of the interactions. We destroyed the burst dynamics, we destroyed the linking or even doing correlations, I will explain next. And we kept the uh, community structure because we didn't touch the structure at all. Okay? Finally, what I call link link or even beam correlations, people also used to call it higher order temporal correlations, are those type of causal correlations, what I already mentioned, when I call Bruno to go out for a beer, and Bruno is calling Radek because he wants to involve. So the call, my call is inducing the action or the appearance of another call. Okay? Actually, you can identify this type of motives in the temporal structure uh, with a technique uh, we did developed a couple of years ago. By looking for, you can actually apply a reference model by shuffling the times, and you can highlight how um, uh, relevant your observation as compared to the frequency you observe in the empirical data set as compared to the reference number. Okay? Here's a publication if you're interested. So what we would like, we would like to remove this type of correlation. We would like to remove this causal, causal correlation between consecutive events appearing between uh, a small group of nodes. How we do this? What we do, again, we select two links, but we have the condition that we select two links randomly of links which have exactly the same number of interactions because we want to keep them weights unchanged. So I have a guy who has, I don't know, 17 interactions, and I have another guy who has 17 interactions. I have all the guys who have 17 interactions. I select two of them randomly, and I change the interaction, interaction sequence. Okay? Because the timing of the events will change these causal correlations between, like, leaks sharing a single node to be destroyed. Okay? There are possible alternative null models. So here I destroy event even correlations and I keep everything else. Alternative null models could be that actually I take the interaction sequence and then I reverse it. Okay? If I read the interaction sequence in the reverse order, everything is the same but causally they destroy. Okay? Exactly the example I gave, if I want to pass the information calling Bruno and Bruno calls Radek, is, this, is different than uh, Radek calls Bruno before I even call, uh, after I call Bruno. Okay? This is one possible way to, to get the same, sorry, get the same result. Another possible way is self-reference, is that actually if you have very long observations, you can cut it with different phase, and then uh, you can measure the same at different times, and you can compare. And the, and the third one is that actually you have the timing of, an ev of events on a single link, you select a random time shift, and you shift all the events a little bit away, and on every link you do this with different random times, so they will be not synchronized anymore, or the possible causal correlations between events will be destroyed. Okay? What you get is very surprising. Well, not very surprising, but slightly surprising, is that actually linking correlation, this causal even given correlations are not slowing down, but fastening up the spreading process on the short temporal scale. This is the green line. It's a little bit faster than the red line. A little bit slower than the red line. Okay? Which means that even these causal correlations are helping the, to pass information. Maybe it's answering a little bit your, your question. If I have an important information, it may call cause a buzz around me, which is helping the dissemination of the information. Okay? On the other hand, if you look at the long temporal scale, it is not true. This is actually the distribution of the time that the information reached 100% of the nodes. Okay? You see that if I use the original even sequence, it takes almost 700 days that I reach, on average, everyone in the network. If I remove all the correlations, it's around 300 days. And even 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 correlations on the long run are slowing down the process, not fastening up. Okay? So this is not a very new result, it's from 2011. There was a 
it is very funny and we realized a parallel group working on a very similar subject by Esteban Moro, who is going to speak here tomorrow. So they arrived to the same conclusion, but using an SIR process. Okay? It was an enlightening moment. Very well. So the main conclusion here is that the responsible for the slow spreading of information beyond the temporal nature of interactions is the burst dynamical patterns and the weight topology correlations. Yeah? This is a general kind of question about the SI model or SI model on temporal networks. Um, given that the SI model is kind of a probabilistic model where the contagion occurs based on probability rather than the local structure um, surrounding the network, um, would temporal networks, so, so would the SI model on temporal network simply uh, delay the adoption process of that uh, on static networks? You mean that the nature of the, the, the spreading process does not change, just it is delayed? Uh, yes, I mean, in general, yeah. So can you kind of try scaling between uh, the adoption process on temporal networks and static networks? Well, uh, I, I cannot recall a paper which is comparing the two type of representation, static and temporal representation, in the case of spreading processes, but as already mentioned, Bruno has already mentioned, as I'm going to explain tomorrow, if you consider here activity in temporal networks, he was speaking about the activity-driven network model, I'm going to speak about it tomorrow. There, the activity of nodes are determining the degrees of nodes in the static structure. So in order to um, solve the spreading process on a temporal network, you better consider activity instead of degree. And what you observe is that the, the threshold appears as a fraction of the first and the second moment of the activity distribution, which is a result very similar to what has been observed in static network by Raskin-Mani and Bastor Satoras. Okay, so in that sense, they are, I don't know whether it is answering your question, but I, I, I don't know a paper about which is looking at whether the nature, or the, the order of the phase transition or anything like this is changing or just shift it in time, okay? In case of uh, SI process, it is still, I believe, a second order phase transition. Uh, and this is, there is actually, uh, you know, SI process, there is no threshold value. There is necessarily everyone is infected in the end of the process. Only the speed of the spreading is scaled by the infection rate. So uh, I would assume that the nature of the phase trans there is no phase transition, actually. In case of SI or SIR, I would assume there is no change. It will be still second order, just as in case of static networks. Very well. So here the message that the burst of temporal behavior is responsible to slow down the epidemic spreading was actually causing a lot of debate in the field because there were other observations claiming the opposite, saying that burst of temporal patterns are actually fastening up the spread of information. So to complete this picture, I'm going to give another example, another model, which is, in which case, actually, the burstiness has the opposite effect, okay? And uh, this will be a threshold model, uh, not the usual threshold model. It is what people call history-dependent on which the contagion, okay? It was published by Peter Horner, uh, uh, Takaguchi and Mashunga, I think, to send them. 13. Okay? So the process is very simple. They take a temporal network uh, and each node, they assign each node with a counter, so to speak, which counts how many times this node was tried to be infected in the past. Okay? So this could be interpreted as like the concentration of pathogen on the given node. They also assume that each node have a threshold. If this volume, the number of times, for example, I try to be infected, is above my threshold, actually I get infected. Okay? And there is another um, uh, assumption, is that this number, the, the concentration, this mean variable, is actually decreasing as an exponentially after each uh, stimuli. Okay? So if there is a stimuli, it is increased by one, 
And then, if there is no stimuli for a couple of, couple of times, that it starts to decrease exponentially, as it explained here. You will understand better from this figure. This is the interaction sequence of a node. This is, for example, how the mu variable is increasing when there is an interaction with the unit. And then there is another interaction, it will be increased again. And then there are no interactions for a couple of, for a couple of time steps, it starts to decrease exponentially. So if there is a bursty period, which means that there are a lot of interactions in a very short time, this counter will be hit many times, so it will have no time to decrease back. So actually it may reach a level where the threshold of the individual is reached and the node becomes infected. Okay? And intuitively you can see that in this case, the burstiness is actually uh, fastening up the epidemic process, because if there wouldn't be burstiness, no one would reach the threshold because they would still, they would have always a small concentration of pathogen on them, okay? It is numerically represented as shown here. This is the original event sequence, and this is once, so, sorry, this is the original event sequence, and this is once we shuffled the time of interactions, which means that we removed the bursty uh, nature of the bursty interactions, the, the bursty signal from the interaction, uh, interaction sequences. And you see that by removing burstiness, actually the process is uh, slowing down, which means that burstiness is causing a faster spreading in the original sequence. Okay? It has been also shown if you are looking for the, the phase diagram of uh, the emergence of a global uh, cascade of epidemics, you see that by, by varying, uh, actually, the, by shuffling the network, the phase which is allowing for global epidemics is shrinking, which means that actually burstiness is helping uh, the global spreading of the given epidemic process. Okay? So as a conclusion, the contrary what we had before, that actually burstiness helps the nose to reach the threshold within a short time window, and uh, repeated interactions with infected neighbors play an important role here. Burstiness is helping the inf uh, infection to spread. Contrary, in case of information spreading, there we also that burstiness is actually slowing down the information spreading. Okay? It is just to, to uh, complete the picture. I'm not going to speak about them. threshold models anymore. I think this is the subject of James in the coming talk. So this is where I would like to stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>